We're gonna go through payment systems. What is a payment system, in fact? Some trends around the payment system, which is a little bit of a statistical review. And then critically think about the pain points. Uh, a list that I've sort of been keeping as I teach FinTech, and those also as I think about cryptocurrencies and how they might insert themselves in this space. Some trends around the globe with nations trying to move forward with real-time gross settlement. The idea that you could settle payment transactions instantaneously, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, which many nations don't do yet. Some do, we'll get into that. And then the landscape itself, what, what, what are the companies doing and so forth? Harkening back to last uh, discussion, what are we seeing in the crypto projects and tokenization? And then close out on Facebook, Libra, and China's digital currency electronic payment project. So a lot to cover, but please, as I had said, uh, videos on so we can keep this sense of community and audio off. But anytime you have a question, raise the blue hand in the participant area, uh, engage in the chat room amongst yourselves, or uh, Romain would be good enough just to inter interrupt me when he sees something interesting in the chat. Uh, or for that matter, even if you're a student and you see something interesting in the chat that Romaine's not raising, you can raise your hand and say, I see three things in the chat room and I want to uh, 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 capture that for the class and so forth. Um, so the readings today, uh, I thought it was interesting to take a speech by Lael Brainerd. Lael is on the U.S. Federal Reserve Board. And as they do in many uh, commissions and and boards of central banks around the globe, they allocate different projects. Now, Lael is part of the Federal Open uh, Markets Committee and helps set interest rates, but she also is that key player on the reserve board around payments. And so she gave a speech about the updating and where we stand, and I hope you found that helpful. Um, uh, along with Neha Narula, uh, we did a cryptocurrency online course last summer in the payment system space was something we wrote just as a background as a primer in this area and then some payment innovations in the fintech space and a little map uh, about nine payment tracks so i hope that was helpful if you haven't dug into it i do think that Lael's speech is a good uh, update as to where we are, and particularly as the U.S. Federal Reserve is thinking about things like Facebook's Libra, thinking about going to real-time gross settlements in something called Fed Now that won't be rolled out now for three or four years. But I think Lael gives a good sense of where things are. Um, so just if, if we can have a little bit of conversation here, and Romain will help uh, facilitate, but. What are the key challenges and opportunities in the current system, just from your, your own perspective? In essence, what do you think I will later have on that list of pain points if you've uh, not yet uh, downloaded the slides? But Romain? Let's see who will be the first volunteer for today. Yeah, just to get it a little bit interesting. Still waiting for a blue hand. Hassan. I use the front page. You might have to go. What do you have, Romain? Hassan, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah, about the payment system, um, I've noticed that uh, there is kind of, of a monopoly, especially here in the Middle East. All the payments are, or, or, I would say almost all payments are through Visa, MasterCard, and Amex. And if you could see that these companies, take a percentage of the merchant and i don't know if you guys have this in the states but sometimes for instance in my country in bahrain um if i would go and buy something if i know the owner personally he would say hey listen if you if, if you would pay me in cash i could give you like a discount so i think that there are many opportunities for companies that could maybe take less money and um, I don't and and exploit this 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 opportunity. And so let's capture two themes that you picked up there, and there are many others. And I see Andrew's hand up, so we'll have some other discussions. Cost, 
you're saying that the current payment rails, my word, that the current payment rails have a significant cost. And you also mentioned uh, the concentration. You said monopoly, some might say oligopolies, but there's a concentration usually in the payment systems. And this comes by and large, not only because of the history of payments, but also the significant network effects. That if you have one central sort of payment mechanism, whether it's a clearinghouse in days of old, or in the last 40 years, the credit card companies became uh, very significant in the payment space. They had network effects of scale, bringing merchants on the one side, the store owners on the one side, and the consumers on the other side together, and the platform economics create a significant network effect. So there's a lot of concentration. But uh, Andrea or others? Andrea? Yeah. So I'm not fully sure if, if, if this is related or if you consider it also payment, but I think like one of the biggest opportunities and also challenges is still to resolve the international payment. So basically how you send the money across the borders. There are many startups like everyone knows TransferWise who are doing a great job. But when you think about it, it's still the way their business model or how it works, it's still not basically instant sending of money. And there are a couple of limitations. For example, you also need to do it. Um, uh, you also need to, or you are allowed to, to send the money internationally if you have a bank account. But I, for example, know I was, I was working in the Middle East where, for example, there is um, a lot of people, a lot of international people coming you know, and working there and they are sending uh, a lot of money back to their families, home. Um, and for example, a lot of them don't have a banking account. So they're right. using services such as Western Union. So, so let's- and I, very I, expensive. I think Andrea was good. She raised three points in there. I see Ivy's hand and then we'll close. But the three points I heard, cross-border, sending payments from one nation to another. Now that could be because it's, moving from one currency to another, or even if it's in the same currency, if you're using US dollars and sending it cross-border or using euro or yen and sending it cross-border, you're jumping between two different payment systems, two different banking systems. And so cross-border, same currency or cross-border, cross-currency, there's a significant amount of costs embedded in that. There's time delays that Andrea mentioned uh, until you can have settled money. Final settled money means that you can actually use it in your uh, commercial daily lives. And then thirdly, I think Andrea raised inclusion, whether everybody has access to that system. So I thank you. And then Ivy, and then we'll move on. Sorry, I actually had some earlier points that I think just building up um, off of that, um, like things like Plaid, I think are quite interesting because you really need this. I, I guess I kind of think about it as like a, um, the plumbing of the like payment system, if you will, because you, they really need to plug into so many different types of payment systems, um, all these different financial institutions. And like just even thinking about um, inclusion and kind of consumer, like customer behavior and uh, consumer credit behavior across countries and just, like entirely different, like um, people in the UK don't, or in Europe in general, I don't think use credit cards as much as um, Americans do. People in Asia are really used to using Alipay, WeChat, like QR codes have, have, become, a big, have become a big thing. And like in Canada, um, like people pay down their, their debt much faster than like we do. So just trying to think about how all these, um, you know, different players, both on the consumer side, as well as on the, you know, supply side, if you will, uh, it, it will fit into the entire system in the future. So Ivy's mentioned a bunch of cultural and, and, and geographic differences. Country by country, we have differences in our payment systems. Uh, we have different cultural behaviors about paying down our debt and so forth. Uh, and you mentioned one company, Plaid, that helps the, the plumbing. And, and what's interesting is, is that uh, the word plumbing and banking or plumbing and uh, payments is an age old thought. Actually, when Alexander Hamilton, uh, our uh, nation's first secretary of the treasury, helped found one of the first banks in the nation, the Bank of New York, that still is part of the Bank of New York Mellon, this was in the 1780s, 
they took as their logo, logo is a modern word, but they took as their symbol uh, something that looked like plumbing. Literally that they thought of banking as like water works or a, a central utility sending money around rather than sending water around. Um, so I thank you for that. But yes, plaid is part of that plumbing. And as Andrea said, TransferWise is trying to find a gap in the cross border. They're not alone. There's Remitty and World Remit, and many other companies also. But And so th this is a long question, but just anybody want to say, what lessons can you take from kind of big tech in this space? Alipay, WeChat Pay, M-Pace, et cetera. Just big tech, and secondly, any lessons from all the, the startups. So it's kind of two buckets, but it's what, 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 what can you sort of take from the competitive landscape, either big tech or the disruptors? Anyone? I'm sure that some of you use these companies, whether you're in, from Asia and you use many of the big tech ones, or even in the US if you do, or um, you're, you're bound to use Venmo, which is owned by PayPal or something, so. So we have Luke and then Yi. Great. So which side are the big, big tech or, or disruptors? I'm sorry, say that again. Are again. you addressing big tech or the disruptors? Um, so let's go with big tech, but I guess it's not too messy when I talk about, for example, Kakao Pay, which is the uh, the payment platform made by Kakao Tung, Kakao Group, which is the largest uh, the chat company in Korea, and basically it's WhatsApp of Korea. So whether it be Kakao Pay or WeChat Pay, Alipay, Apple Pay. The key thing is it's very, very easy um, compared to the bank. Now the banks are trying to catch up with the API open banking system and all that, but basically the UI user interface is pretty easy to use. And if you have a problem, if you contact custom service, they will contact you right away versus banks, you know, make you wait 20 minutes, blah, blah, blah. So I have to say it as a banker, but so it is what it is. The key lesson you're saying is, it's easier, it's got a user interface that's quite convenient. And while I didn't use the word, it's also ubiquitous. And so Kako Pay in, in Korea, Line Pay in Japan and, and uh, Taiwan, uh, WeChat Pay, Alipay, M-Pesa, really leapfrogged the banking system, but there was a very established banking system in Korea, and yet still Kako Pay uh, leaped over. Not as much so in the US. I mean, yes, Google Wallet is there. Yes, Apple Pay is there, and they're significant. Less so for Facebook, actually. I think that's because of the- Three of them are weaker, in a sense, uh, adoption, Google, Apple, Facebook in the US, than uh, we find in Korea uh, or China. But I think that's more because of, not because of overbanking or the power of bank. Um, it's more because of the telecom ser services. How, how reachable, approachable you are with the, the LTE speed or 3G speed you have here in big land of America. So, you're, so what Luke's raising is there's also facts on the ground about how developed the technology is, whether it was already at 3G or 4G or how developed the technology uh, was on the ground. So it's not just about how developed the banking system is, but also technology. Romain, we had uh, somebody else that might take the disruptor side. Thank you. Yes. Good. Yi, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to raise a trend that lots of the payment system. And then Yi, do we, uh, do we have a video? Do we have your face? Yeah, I just like very ugly this morning. But oh, oh, I'm <laughs> sure you look fine. You look great. Yeah, so I, I just feel like um, there's a, a key trend uh, between like the, the, even like, including the, the big tech payment firms as well as like the, the fintech firm, it's a social media. Like people want to pay via the social media. This is happening like between the Alipay, WeChat Pay, the Kakao Pay, and also like the Venmo. You know, you can connect with friends, you can um, send stickers, you can send, uh, express your emotions, you can make your, your transactions available to your social network. And I think this is also like similar to M-Pesa in, in Kenya. So I feel like this is a key trend that people uh, don't want to uh, 
you know, like only uh, make the transaction with banks, which is very separate and individual. Um, they want to make transactions with their social network. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that's probably a larger factor with regard to the big tech companies, but it is also true that it's a factor with the, 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 st the startups. Um, and then uh, lastly, uh, a question is, do you think stable value coins, tokenized assets, even the, the initiative of Libra, uh, what, what, what will that do on this payment space? Um, in essence, are they hype or are passing fad or are they gonna do something here? Any opinions on this? We're going to help out. We're going to help out. We have a poll. This is exactly when we can sort of then ask a poll to, to tease this out. You, you've done terrific that no one answered because now Romain's going to pull up a poll. Uh, and this is more broadly, this is about blockchain technology, but uh, curious what uh, everyone thinks here. So you should now see a poll with three different questions on your screen. This is a little bit more broadly as to whether financial firms will incorporate blockchain technology into their business models as they've already incorporated AI and machine learning, as they've been incorporating open API, will this be a fundamental feature in the next two, five or 10 years or not at all? 20% uh, of the class voted so far. Please check the window and vote. Romain, I, I, I like your ability to pull in the votes. I, you might have a job to do come November to, uh, in our next uh, general election here. Are you confident it's going to take place? I, I, yes, I am confident under our constitutional system that we will have an election. Excellent. Okay, we have 70% of the class that has voted. I'm gonna let five more seconds. 10 seconds. Yeah. And we reached 80%. Thank you everyone for sharing your thoughts. I'm sharing the results with you. You should now be able to see them. So let's see that the, the class tends to be uh, optimistic that blockchain technology will be incorporated in even though it might take five to ten years it looks like the 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 uh the mode is five years or five or ten years the uh in terms of what will it have uh, will be um beyond speculative digital store value will bitcoin become the currency of choice in some part of the economy uh, the generally 60 some percent say no. Um, and then who is Satoshi Nakamoto? Well, that was just sort of my one little uh, question uh, because of course we don't know who Satoshi Nakamoto is, this uh, woman or man who wrote the eight page white paper and put it out on the internet 12 years ago. But it looks like a third of you said maybe it was a foreign state actor or 20% said US intelligence. Um, so, okay, so let's get back to payments. I like, I like this uh, thoughts uh, there. If you wanna take that window, you have to, I think, get rid of the poll individually, which I'm about to do now. Uh, yes, thank you. As well. Um, so what is a payment system? Let's sort of just dive in and talk about what it is and, and it's been around the century, so it's not a new thing. It's, but in a digital world, in a ledger-based world, it's a method to change a ledger. Now, this isn't an accounting class. I'm not going to bore you with accounting. But basically, if I'm moving money to you, somebody has to lower my account, credit my account. Remember, uh, assets are debits. So credit means it's going down. <laughs> A little bit of accounting here. And then somebody else's account has to be debited. So one debit, one credit, one account goes down, one account goes up. It's also about authorizing those uh, movements, 
and then what's called clearing and final settlement. And earlier we discussed that in some times final settlement doesn't happen for a couple of days. In, in a long time ago, if you wrote a physical check, you might not have it settled, meaning having money in your account for five days or longer. Even. Now it's closer to two days. Um, but it's basically amending and recording those ledgers. That's what it is in an accounting system. And so how did we do this? This is just some fun, you know, background, but Thomas Jefferson, the writer of the Declaration of Independence, actually you can find online a check he wrote to himself. I'm not quite sure why he did. Uh, this would have been the year after he was president, but he wrote a check to himself. So physical personal checks have been around a long time, but they are basically an instruction called negotiable orders of withdrawal, but an instruction to a bank to amend a ledger. Lower my ledger and give me maybe paper cash or lower my ledger, raise somebody else's. All of a sudden, the telegraph comes along and a company, Western Union, which still exists, Western Union comes along and it's a telegram company, but they figure out how to send money by telegram, the, the FinTech of its time. And yes, there were machines that looked like this, Telex machines. These were ubiquitous across financial firms in the 1950s to the 1970s. I will admit, I saw one or two of these when I was on Wall Street still in the 1980s. But a Telex machine existed basically to send instructions on payments around to another bank. But what's it look like today? Well, first, the important thing is central banks sit in the middle of payment systems. This was not as true in terms of the, I'm just trying to move a window out of the way. Um, this was not as true in the physical coin and currency world, but here this little chart puts the central bank at the top. And we have central banks around the globe, 180 different fiat currencies. The central banks are central to commercial banks. And what's important to remember is our money system has trans, uh, has moved on from being paper money to basically digital money. And so today in the US, if you think about the total stock of currency, the total stock of paper currency prior to this corona crisis was about $1.8 trillion. Uh, it's actually gone up in the last month. It seems that there are people that want to take cash out of the bank, out of the ATM as a store of value. Um, around the globe. We're not using it. It's a sort of disease vector, but it seems that the growth in, and it might be now 1.9 trillion. So it's sort of gone up $100 billion or so, approximately. But the digital money, all of, all of people's bank accounts, bank deposits, money market funds is multiples of that, 15 or so trillion dollars. So about 90% of the money in the US is, depending upon your definition of money, is digital. And most of that digital money is commercial bank money. You and I, when we go into Starbucks, we're basically spending Bank America dollars or Citibank dollars or Wells Fargo dollars or SunTrust dollars or a community bank dollar. That's what we're spending when we walk into Starbucks. It might have some implicit or explicit guarantee of a government here in the US, deposit insurance and the like, but we're in essence saying to Bank of America, please change my ledger balance and move something to somebody else's ledger balance, maybe a community bank for that uh, local uh, Starbucks. So in between has to be some electronic means, some payment system, a deferred net settlement system, and, and this chart lists a number of them. These payment systems are the domain of central banks. Some, do, some central banks actually run them, like the US Federal Reserve runs something called the Fed Wire, but some are run by a consortium of the commercial banks. Some are private, and in some countries they can even be for profit but all of them have some regulation from the central bank. So either the central bank owns them or the central bank oversees them. 
and usually then the commercial banks might run these sort of single purpose payment systems around the globe. Some countries have multiple systems. The US, we have the Fed system and we also have something called the automated clearinghouse that's that the clearinghouse was founded in the 1850s to give you a sense of its history, a long history. Questions remain any? None so far, Gary. All right, so you'll see how this fits together, but let me say what the modern payment system looks like when, when, um, when I think of, of it in terms of you go into Starbucks and you wanna make a payment. Um, you're the consumer, we're gonna go across, you have an issuing bank, let's use Bank of America just to say, and you're giving that bank, Bank of America, a payment instruction. Now, on an earlier day, you could write a physical check, like Thomas Jefferson's check. You could use a credit card, a debit card, a, 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 some prepaid card, but you have to give some payment instruction. If even that QR code that you pass, and we'll get to Alipay and WeChat Pay in a moment, it, it, there is a payment instruction somewhere, digital payment instruction. And then at the heart, in the middle, is a network. Now, these payment service providers, PSPs in the middle, or networks, could be associated with a credit card company, the Visa credit card network, founded in the late 1950s by Bank of America, a California bank at the time, and sort of became ubiquitous by the late 1960s. Visa, MasterCard, Union Pay in, in China, can, can both be credit cards and networks, or there could be a network that services the credit cards. But you need something in the middle, because on the other side, there's tens of thousands of merchants, or millions of merchants if you get to China. And on their side, they have another bank. But they need some way to access this network, a point of sale, POS is point of sale or by phone or by some modern mechanism to access that network. And then the, the merchant on the other side. So you have consumer all the way to merchant. You have banks, the issuing bank. The issuing bank is that party that sort of says, all right, I'm gonna take a in payment instruction. And you have the merchant bank on the other side or acquirer bank, sometimes it's called. But in the middle, there's some network and it leads to a lot of concentration because there's such significant economic and network effects in a modern digital payment system. Questions? Yes, we have questions from Carlos and then Jose. Please. I, so I wanted to ask, um, I know in, in a lot of developing markets now making the, since you mentioned, mentioned the ACH, making it real time is, is a big focus and using different technologies, right? So could you explain, I guess, the magnitude of difference that having a real-time ACH system versus not makes? We're gonna, we're gonna dive into this in, a, in, in, in about a half an hour, but let me try it very quickly, Carlos, and then remind me as we get back to it. Um, as a merchant, as a merchant, there's a value to getting final settlement when you, sell your coffee or sell your produce or a big machine, whatever you're selling. And, and there's the value because there's certainty and there's also timing. So if you can get your cash on Monday rather than Wednesday, there's a value to it. Payment systems around the globe historically could give you final settlement if you used physical cash. And physical cash under the laws of of the developed world became final settlement from, from the earliest days. Uh, there's a famous lawsuit called the Crawford case, if you ever want to look it up, about final settlement using physical cash. It's from the days of King George II, I think. But digitally, digitally, it was harder to give final settlement. We still have delays. So what's happened in the last 25 years, as many nations have said, can we get to real-time settlement rather than delayed settlement of one day, two days, or in the old days, five days. And trying to get to that real-time settlement has been a challenge, and we'll go through different countries in, in about a half an hour. Let me hold that. 
but a lot of countries, central banks around the globe are trying to get to real time settlement. But the value is to the merchant that they have finality, that they can then use those funds in some way. And I can tell you, even when I was the chief financial officer of the Hillary Clinton campaign in 2016, we had to deal with it. We were the merchant on the right hand side. We might get a donation, but until that donation actually settled, sometimes several days later, sometimes a day later, it was different settlement cycles. But until that settled, we couldn't actually use it to buy advertisements on, let's say, Facebook or Google ads. So we need it even, even in that sort of instance, particularly when you get down to the last six or 10 days before election time, those days matter. So I, I kind of live this as a, other questions? Yes, Jose. Yeah, so I'm not sure if this is a bit out of the scope of the class, but I'm, I've always been very curious on why um, do, are checks so prevalent in the US? Uh, so for example, in Spain, I've never used a check in my life. And I think it's, it doesn't seem to be a very efficient way of transferring money versus, for example, a wire transfer. But in the US, it seems like banks sometimes charge you more for wire transfers and they require more security uh, passwords and things for wire transfers than for checks. And so I don't really understand very, why. Very much part, it's part of the pain points and each country has a little bit different heritage. Um, of course, through the 1960s, physical checks were a very important dominant part of, of many payment systems. It was only in the 1990s that the U.S. government said by uh, an act of Congress that the U.S. government should move to electronic payment of Social Security and other uh, important parts that the government pays money. But even then, the adoption was supposed to be by the late 1990s and there was various exemptions and so forth installed. And so we even see now in the middle of the Corona crisis that you can read in today's newspapers that the $1,200 that's moving out of our tax authority, the IRS, to individuals, while the bulk of that's electronic, 80 or 90 million of those will be electronic, it's estimated that there's still millions of people that will get physical checks uh, in the US. So we still have a this legacy that's probably a little bit more dominant. I'm gonna show some statistics on check uses uh, in, in a moment. Um, some of it's cultural, some of it's actually commercial. Uh, at the middle of all this are banks, and in the middle is these networks in the middle. Um, so it's not only cultural, but it's also uh, sometimes uh, hard for a merchant to say, I wanna pay, the merchant, remember, has to pay, the two and a half percent cost if you're going to be take, accepting visa. So the cost of interchange fees, the cost that, that the credit card companies are taking here in the U.S. average around two and three quarters percent, 2.75 percent. So a lot of merchants still would prefer to take a check than that 2.75. You go over to China and you say, well, within the Alipay, WeChat pay systems, the cost are significantly lower. In fact, if you're all within, within service, within system, it's zero percent. In India, I think it's around 10 basis points. So there's a lot of reasons a merchant might say, all right, I, I might prefer if you can give me an ACH or a check. So it gives you a little background. Um, but layered on top of this system is all these digital wallets. An invention really just of the last 20 years. And, 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 and whether it's here in, in the US or overseas, a lot of these are related to big tech. Not, not only, but a lot are related to big tech. And then the question is, uh, will cryptocurrency play some role? Can crypto kind of skip some of these inefficiencies and, and, and play a role? And so with that, some of the trends, just a a quick look, and this, this goes to, the, this is from a report, WorldPay, which is a big payment company, puts out an annual report each year. And uh, this is their most recent uh, report that came out in February of 2020. But around the globe, mobile wallets are estimated to already be 42% of global e-commerce. Now, this is important, this is e-commerce. If you go off to the big wholesale payments or large value payments, different story but this is 
electronic payments in the e-commerce space, and then point to sale payments. Cash is still a pretty big piece of the worldwide global uh, environment for point of sale, whereas e-commerce, basically online, using your mobile phone or your laptop, can't really use cash much. Cash on delivery is still 4.5%, though, interestingly. That's world pay sort of overall view, but they say credit card will, will decline, debit cards decline, bank transfers about even. And so what's increasing? Digital mobile wallets, and then of course at point of sale, cash declining, and there you will see increases in their estimation. But the US is a little different. The US, or North America, which is the best statistics I could grab off the world pay, we still have a significant amount of credit card. Look at that. Credit card's still a third. Digital mobile wallets, 23%. And from a merchant's point of view, they would prefer actually to have something that takes the less bite out of it. Here in the US, debit cards, by an act of Congress, in, after the 2008 crisis, Carl Levin, a senator from Illinois, said we should make sure that debit cards do not, uh, and banks issuing debit cards can't charge more than the cost of actually issuing that debit card. And after a series of rulemakings by the central bank, the Federal Reserve, that settled out. But debit cards are a little less costly than credit cards for the banks. Um, and in terms of trends, just in the US specifically, this is from the Federal Reserve in December of this past year. But this just gives you a sense. 20-year history. Checks, and this is overall payment trends, this is not just e-commerce, checks were 45% 20 years ago, and you can see that line just kind of declined, declined, declined. So to Jose's point, we're not quite there yet. Spain, Spain might be down to 5% on checks or something, but you can see where, where we are. And, and this is the number of payment instructions. This is dollar amounts. So in terms of dollars, Checks only went, you know, kind of lost this parade eight years ago. So one is volume of payments, one is the actual uh, checks and so forth. And large value payments are included here, the other charts did not. So, and just one last thing in terms of the e-commerce side of it and card payments, this just gives you a sense of remote and in-person that uh, I like this sort of right hand chart, but the trillions of dollars we move, we are moving on our physical cards more remote than we are in person. This gives an opportunity to startups. Startups can say, wait, Visa MasterCard in, in many countries has this two and three quarter percent. Maybe we can get inside that pricing. Maybe we can get inside, especially as we move from in-person to remote payments as an opportunity. Um, so that brings us to sort of a, a list of pain points. What, yeah, what are those pain points? Perhaps. Um, please remain. Actually, before we move there, I think Hassan had a question. Please, Hassan. Hassan, you might need to take your uh, mute off. Uh, yeah, um, about payments. So, for instance, um, you can see like we have like bank transfers and 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 uh, e-wallets. So my question is, uh, for instance, um, I was trying to pay my landlord while I was in Bahrain because I still have a, my apartment in in Cambridge, and if the amount exceeds like certain uh, number, they have to send me a message. Um, which which could be annoying because if my mobile isn't isn't working they would not like send me an email so is it like the the system the whole system the whole payment system kind of supports uh, bank transfers when it comes to big payments and small transfers when it comes to um, e-wallets and mobile payments well i'm not sure of your question it is true that ultimately sitting in, in the midst of this uh, with the risk of going back a bunch of slides, there has to be something, well, I'll just stay here. There has to be an instruction 
there has to be an instruction that moves it from an issuing bank to an acquiring bank. So your landlord would be the merchant here. Your landlord's bank has to get an instruction somehow. So even if it's in this orange box, the digital wallets at the top, you have to send an instruction somewhere that takes funds from your, your bank, which is called an issuing bank, and somehow moves those funds to the uh, landlord's bank. And what you're finding is, is that your merchant bank, the acquiring bank, on behalf of your landlord is saying, listen, if it's greater than a certain dollar amount, we need a second security check. And, the, and the, the mobile wallet company has basically inserted that, that check, I think is what you're telling me. Um, you could have that same similar thing. Venmo has a limit. I don't think you could move a million dollars on Venmo, for instance. Venmo is a PayPal subsidiary. And Venmo is actually uh, avoids those credit card fees. Venmo is a form of account to account transfer. And your account at your bank to somebody else's account. And account to account transfers are a very important feature of, of the competition, but still Venmo is not gonna move a million dollars without having additional security checks. So that's probably what's happening here, uh, I, I, I fear to say. Yeah, yeah, I mean, my point is, it's, it's a bit annoying because uh, I would, I mean, for instance, because my mobile, uh, is, is a prepaid mobile, so I could not receive a message from my bank. Oh, well, so I, can't, well I, can't, I can't solve that for you here, but I, I think that's part of what you're saying. That's part of these pain points yeah. is that uh, uh, fraud. Basically, when you think of all the pain points, uh, you and I as users, we want something that's easy to use, nearly costless, we're willing to spend something, but we'd prefer not to spend two to 3% of our purchases on the payment system. And we'd want it not to have complexity. Uh, the cross-border payments that we talked about earlier, um, we kind of know that they're, they're tracking us, they're getting our data, but we're a little concerned about data privacy. And so, so you're capturing one of the pain points around fraud. And, and that's from the merchant side. The merchant doesn't want the fraud, but also you don't want it. You don't want somebody to be able to tap into your account and move your money out. And the pain point sounds like the fraud detection system that your bank is using is requiring your mobile phone in a way that's uh, uh, friction. It, it, it's frankly friction. It's similar to a pain point. It used to be until very recently if you traveled overseas, you were better uh, to tell your bank that you were gonna be using your credit card in Spain or France or Asia or Bahrain. Mm -hmm. um, but now no longer because now they have, uh, you know, they, ha they use our mobile phones to say they track us. They know that we're in Spain or France or Asia or Bahrain. Mm -hmm. That's part of the reason we don't need to call any longer. Mm -hmm. um, but that's part of their fraud detection programs. Let me keep moving on if I can. And um, uh, So there's a series of pain points, and I don't necessarily have all of them, but these are also, you can think of them as opportunities. Um, these are opportunities for disruptors to say, can, maybe we can provide a better service. Maybe we can um, uh, uh, provide something at a lower cost. Uh, uh, and, and more inclusive. These are the possibilities for any startup in a sense. Um, so I talked a little bit about the cost. Uh, this is a couple of years ago, but uh, this Bloomberg article broke down the cost and I find it very helpful. Often in the US and in Europe, we think, all right, I pay $100 for something. You think you paid $100 for it. Well, actually you paid 97 dollars roughly for it and two dollars and 75 cents went to the payment system and that 275 that went to the payment system most of it goes to what's called the issuing bank and again the issuing bank is the purchaser the acquiring bank is the merchant so that merchant bank is only getting 19 cents on average two years ago 
the acquiring bank, Bank of America, or whomever issued the credit card. So the dominant part of the economics here is on the credit card side. Those seven big companies in America being the big four banks of Bank of America and Wells Fargo and Citi and, and, and Chase. But then Cap One is a very big credit card bank. And then of course, American Express and Discover and the like. <clears throat> Those seven big banks are the big issuing banks, but community banks, even, even uh, smaller banks across the land will issue credit cards and they get that roughly $2 out of the $100 purchase. Now, what do they do with it? Part of it is the rewards program. And wrapped up inside of all this is an incentive system that issuing banks are using part of that $2.20 on average, on average about a dollar. I think the national average recently was a dollar and six cents. If you take all the different rewards programs, they come back. So you buy something for a hundred, Two dollars and twenty cents goes to your issuing bank. A dollar might come back to you as a reward, <clears throat> and it makes the behavioral science is important. It makes this stuff sticky. It makes us loyal to our cards in a way that pure economics, you would think, that would be easier to disrupt this space. So I wouldn't put aside some of these reward programs when you're thinking about. All right, I'm going to be a disruptor. I'm going to. I'm gonna break into the payment space. The credit card companies uh, uh, are, you know, they, they have a point of view on this too, and they're gonna to wanna to protect their, their market share. Questions, Romain? Anything? Let's give it a few seconds, just in case someone wants to raise their hand. Yeah, so we gonna, have Leonor. Leonor has a question. Sure, and then I'm gonna do an overview of, of the cost. Uh, it's actually not a, a question, it's just um, in Europe it's a bit different. The interchange fee is actually capped to 0.3% if it's a credit card and 0.2% if it's a debit card, I'm not sure about the numbers. And so I think this has interesting spillovers in terms of rewards programs in, in Europe are definitely not as good as in the US. And then you can also see that the credit card usage is much smaller. And that might be one of the reasons why. No, it's a very good point because around the globe, the official sector inserts themselves from time to time. And, and because of the natural network effects, remember that chart, right in the middle, there's some powerful, powerful economics around network effects. Think of plumbing again. We only have one, uh, uh, we usually only have one electric company, one uh, waterworks company per city because of that incredible network effect of the plumbing. Similar here. And so what some official sectors have said is said, now we have to put a limit on what can be charged. In the US, we did do that. Uh, Senator, um, um, did I say Levin? It was Senator Durbin actually of Illinois. I had to have, sorry. But um, Senator Durbin, the Durbin Amendment, uh, we did that in debit cards, but credit cards, not the case. And then in other countries like in Asia, which really sort of Alipay and WeChat Pay and others leapfrogged and then the official sector was involved in a different way. So you're absolutely right. So rewards programs would be lower, credit card uses might be lower. Um, if you're gonna be starting something, you have to think of those separate uh, dynamics country by country, very much so. Um, the worldwide uh, in, in, interesting report, and this is, this is from uh, a McKinsey report from September of last year. McKinsey puts out an annual report of, of payments. And, and it's a, if you're interested in the area, I didn't assign it as a reading. It's a remarkable report once a year. But this is one chart that I pulled from the, this McKinsey report. The worldwide revenues in the payment system add up to about $1.8, $1.9 trillion. Now, I should caution, McKinsey includes what they call account-related liquidity. And this, quote, account-related liquidity is earning interest for the banks on your credit card balances. 
earlier World Bank statistics would, would say the payment system around the globe takes about a half a percent to 1% of the economy. The worldwide economy before the corona crisis was hovering just short of $100 trillion. The U.S. economy about $22 trillion, the world economy about $95 trillion. But of that $95 trillion, we've probably been spending, McKinsey would say, nearly 2% on our payment system, World Bank would say this, the figure is more like a quarter to a half of that because McKinsey includes all the interest that we're paying on our balances. So this is the opportunity. This is the opportunity if you're saying, aha, what did Stripe, what did TransferWise, what did Plaid C? This is anywhere from a half a trillion dollars at the low end to $2 trillion at the high end, half percent to 2% of the world economy relates to just moving these digital payments back and forth, plus the account-related activity, liquidity, the sort of the, the starting, the, the lending balances on top of that. Uh, Romain, I see the chat room seems to be uh, lit, lighting up quite a bit. Are there questions there or do I keep going? You can keep going. It's mainly students sharing additional resources. All right, great. So we, I was asked earlier, I, I'm sorry, I can't remember now uh, uh, who asked it. Was it Carlos? But I apologize um, about real-time gross settlements. Real-time gross settlements is this conceptual framework that we are all are familiar with in one way or the other. Can I move a digital instruction to move money? So a digital instruction to move money and to have the settlement be relatively fast. Real-time gross settlement. What's the word gross mean? It means that we're not net settling. If you run a settlement system with millions of checks coming into a, a warehouse, and that's literally how the, the, the system of check clearing used to work in New York and elsewhere in this country, um, you can actually net settle. You can say, well, there's these checks coming in from Bank of America to Wells Fargo, and these checks from Wells Fargo to Bank of America, let's net these settlements off against each other. But if you do something in real time, if you do it almost instantaneous, it has to be gross. You can't net the payment instructions between the various banks. Real-time gross settlement is used for large value payments and has been used for large value payments for quite some time. In fact, the early large value models, the Fed wire, 1970, that's 50 years of technology that we've had the Fed wire, meaning I can do what's called a wire instruction. But in the United Kingdom, we had chaps and in uh, China, uh, I'm, I'm going to mispronounce it, but CNAPS, um, high value payment system, the Eurozone target 2002 is actually when the Eurozone was created. So we've had large value models. Coupled with that is something called SWIFT. SWIFT is just a messaging company. SWIFT, the Society for Worldwide Interbank Financial Telecommunications, I think, um, it's basically to send messages to facilitate these interbank. The question in the last 10 to 15 years is can we move from large value to just you and me? In essence, what we think we're doing with Venmo, can I move you money rapidly, instantaneously? And some countries have actually moved forward. Um, it's called real-time retail. And the important thing is it's retail instant payments. Now, a lot of people don't call it real-time retail instant. A lot of people would just call it 24 hours a day, seven days a week, or some people might call it RTGS. But fundamentally, the question is, can we do what, what the Fed, the Reserve of the US did 50 years ago, and the United Kingdom did nearly 40 years ago, can we do that for the retail public, and can we do it 24 hours a day, seven days a week, every day of the year? And the answer is yes, the technology exists. I'm listing here seven or eight countries that either have instantaneous payment systems 
or near instantaneous. Some of these are not literally instantaneous. A couple of them are three cycles a day, um, where, where they do, do this three times a day, and I can't remember each country. But you can see it's relatively recent. And then the US. Well, the US projects, we have this split system. The clearinghouse is owned by 24 major banks in the US, and it's been around since the 1850s. The clearinghouse by 2017 said, we want to provide a real-time payment network, but it's really buying amongst these 24 major banks, all the big banks in the US. The Federal Reserve at first seemed comfortable with that, and then frankly, the rest of the banking community, the banks that weren't the top 24 said, no, not really. And they went to Congress. They went to the US Congress and uh, many members of Congress got involved sort of on behalf of community banks. There's five or 6,000 banks that are not direct members of the clearinghouse. And so now the Federal Reserve is standing up Fed now service. And you can see this in Lael Brainerd's speech. Now, FedNow service is also sort of meant to be like a public utility rather than controlled by these 24 banks. And so there's some interesting dynamics back and forth in the competition. The clearinghouse real-time payment network probably will up its game and FedNow will come along as well. Um, some said that the announcement last year by the Federal Reserve was in reaction to Facebook Libra. And maybe that spurred this a little bit that the official sector was then competing with Facebook because the announcement came just weeks after. Now, I'm, I would imagine the Federal Reserve was working on it a long time beforehand, and we'll close out this lecture today on, on China's digital currency electronic uh, payments program. China and the Federal Reserve in the US both had major announcements right after Facebook Libra. This project, FedNow, and China's both had been Work had been done, but it feels like the announcements were accelerated in, in reaction uh, a bit. We don't know for sure, of course. Um, questions, Romain? None so far, Gary. All right. So what's the payment landscape? Who are the companies? Well, we've talked about big tech, and I'm glad, Luke, I, I think I have uh, 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 Kate Copay on there, oh, thankfully. I, I should have had line pay as well. I mean, but big tech. Okay, we've, we've chatted a little bit about that. And then there's, of course, a bunch of unicorn startups. I could have put another half dozen to a dozen, unicorn being a billion dollars of value or more. But each of these startups have a little bit different way that they've broken into this space. Plaid, which we've chatted a little bit about, uh, Plaid is in this space because they came in through open APIs and, and facilitating the software in the si system. Ripple is a cryptocurrency uh, type company. Uh, 197 is in India. It's really, I could even have put that in the big tech because they started, I think, KTM. New Bank uh, addressed it a little bit from being a, a challenger bank, and we're going to be talking about that in a couple of lectures. Toast picks a sector and they really dominate the restaurant sector. Um, but they, they initially were getting into payments because they were into tablets. So each has a bit of a different story. Um, Rex was about startups and facilitating credit for startups. TransferWise was cross-border as we talked about earlier. So they each found a strategy to build, build themselves into this place. But let's just talk about Alipay and WeChat Pay for a moment. Um, this is even dated because this is nearly a year old, but this is their user base in the last seven years. This remarkable growth of usage between Alipay and WeChat Pay in China, both with approximately a billion users. It's thought that WeChat Pay and Alipay now have 92% of the retail payment space in China. And one of their strategic approaches is that if you have a store of value on an Alipay wallet and you move it to somebody else within the Alipay system, as I understand it, it's still zero cost. If you jump out of service, out of system, 
10 basis points. But this, this conceptual framework, and their pricing model could change at any time, but their pricing model has been historically, if you stay within the Alipay wallet system, heck of a benefit in cost. So merchants then start to want to pay their vendors. And merchants and customers want to stay within those wallet systems to keep those costs down. Significant network effects. Romain? Sijin has her hand up. Please. Uh, yeah. Hi, um, just want to add one point. Um, I think the social uh, platform base is really important. But another thing that um, Alipay is so successful because it's working closely with the government. For example, right now um, in China, we can use a, a QR code in Alipay. Um, when we, uh, like, when we uh, try to get on the shuttle bus or we want to get a train, uh, we can use the Alipay to pay that bill. So actually the government is encouraging all of the citizens to use this like Alipay and WeChat Pay. Yeah, so there's incredible uh, collaboration, what you're talking about, between yeah. government and these, uh, these payment systems. And we've seen this in India as well. India really encouraged the uptake, and, 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 and I could have put various statistics in for India. They're a couple or a few years behind. They're not, they're not as robust and developed in India. Um, but this encouragement by the official sector or the banking sector, sometimes in other countries it can be by the banking sector. But what's interesting in China, and we'll close out on this, is now the Chinese government is offering what one might say is a complement or a competitor to, to WeChat and Alipay through the Chinese Digital Currency Electronic Payment Project, or DCEP. And so they've facilitated the ramp up of Alipay and WeChat Pay, but now they're gonna have an alternative as well. Um, so it's very interesting. And I think in part, this is to facilitate the commercial banks we're losing a significant market share to Alipay and WeChat Pay that the Chinese government may well have been, been encouraged to build their own, they call it a central bank digital currency, but their own wallet system, digital wallet, digital yuan, uh, that will look a lot like Alipay and WeChat wallets. And in fact, uh, this is all being rolled out in 2020, but in fact, the initial uh, pronouncements say that it must be accepted. So just as, just as we have had multiple centuries of laws that are called legal tender laws, and the legal tender laws go all the way back to Genghis Khan in China, where under the coercive power of the state, you must accept the, in those days, the paper bark currency of Genghis Khan, or in the US, you must accept the US dollar for all debts, public and private. Those are called legal tender laws. Something similar is happening right now in China that this DCEP will have to be accepted. At first in certain cities, they're gonna start, I think in two cities, and then they're gonna roll it out over time in other places. Um, so now let's look here in the US, and I picked Facebook, because they haven't been as successful. This remarkable platform, Facebook is so uh, ubiquitous, uh, over 2 billion members around the globe. They've tried multiple times to get into payments starting 11 years ago. Virtual currency in 15 currencies terminated in four years, Facebook credit. They came about in 2015, Facebook Messenger, uh, they started in the U.S., U.K., and France. By 2019, they rolled out of France and the U.K. They, in India, had a pilot that for the longest time was in um, uh, sort of uh, pilot purgatory, in a sense. I mean, Facebook could not get the approval of the Indian government to go beyond one million accounts. They only recently, in, in the early spring of 2020, late winter, got approval that they can move up to 10 million and, and so forth. But it's pending further uh, 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 data standardization and it's conditional on data standardization. And then last November, they announced Facebook Pay. Now that puts aside Facebook Libra. I'm just saying their efforts to do Facebook Pay, bringing together Facebook Messenger, Instagram, WhatsApp, 
uh, is their new effort. You can decide whether you think they'll be successful, but it's interesting that in some circumstances, Facebook's been very successful, but not so much in the payment space. And even Google Wallet and Google Pay has more adoption, and Apple Pay has more adoption than we've seen in Facebook as I understand it. It's hard to get all the statistics. Um, so it, it sort of gives you a little bit of a sense of these challenges. What's the landscape? I'm gonna do it a little quickly, but this is, this is to give you that landscape. First, commercial banks and the bank-owned networks. I, I put here thousands of banks. They've been around since 1784. I, I like picking 1784 because that's the Bank of New York here in the US, Alexander Hamilton's bank. But the clearinghouse literally has been around since the 1850s. It was a place where people took physical checks, negotiable orders or withdraw, and had to take them into a warehouse and clear them. But even Union Pay in China, which was formed amongst 85 banks initially, and some say maybe the People's Bank of China owns something of it too, but Union Pay, these bank consortia. Next in, in this sort of the architecture of the payment landscape, the card companies. I would note that Visa was a consortium. Bank of America was a California bank. It was not a national bank at the time. And Bank of America wanted to offer its California credit card across the country and formed a consortium. It later became an independent company. It later went public and it's got a $373 billion market value as of last Friday. Now, we, we sometimes talk about the big tech firms, the big tech firms, the big four, Microsoft and Google and Amazon and Apple. They all have market values above this. But Visa is one of the 10 highest market cap companies in the country, maybe in the world. And then, of course, MasterCard and so forth, Discover in the Dow. So that's kind of the base layer. But then there's something that you and I don't think a lot about is payment service providers. And these companies have gone through a significant wave of consolidation. These were data companies, basically. It's founded around 20 years ago. Fiserv is a, a, an agglomeration of three or four different companies that have come together over the last few years. But these dominant companies here in the US are the backbones of the payment network right in the middle of that earlier chart that we talked about. 45 to $80 billion in market value each. And now we get to the startups, the startups starting with PayPal with $124 billion of value and Square. And then some companies you might not be as familiar with, but each one of these companies founded usually in the 20 year time frame. I'll put Western Union to the side. Western Union was that company that started in the 1850s. Um, these are publicly uh, um, traded companies. You can look at their financials. If you were actually going to go and compete in this space, I'd largely recommend you've got to pull these financials, read their public statements, see how they make their money. But then there's the private companies. And all I could do to value these companies is go, go to Forbes and Crunchbase and some other sources to say what was their last funding round. Stripe has not gone public yet. Paytm in India has not gone public yet, but these are their last funding rounds. Plaid was purchased for 5.3 billion by Visa. But it sort of gives you that sense, putting aside whether these values will persist or not, and there's hundreds, thousands of other companies in this space uh, competing. Um, as I said, there's a lot of consolidation. And one of the consolidations is around payment service providers. Just in the last 18 months, four big mergers, one in Europe, three in the US, basically consolidation in the middle of this technology. First Data, which was one of the biggest companies that basically was on the merchant side, helping merchants with their point of sale, WorldPay that does this annual report that I talked about, and total system services all bought in the last 15 months. And then in Europe, Worldline bought uh, Ingenico, uh, which was like a cross Europe merger. But we're seeing a lot of mergers also in the data aggregator side. Visa bought Plat, as we talked about, and SoFi recently announced for over a billion dollars 
buying Galileo. Galileo is a smaller competitor of Plaid that is in this sort of API data aggregator space, a really important space in payments. SoFi, which we'll talk about in our next couple of classes, sort of started as a credit provider, not in the payment side, but here they, it's interesting that SoFi is going back and saying, we want to get to that payment side. We want to sort of acquire Galileo on the API side. Um, and so a little talk, and we've only got a few minutes left. We already talked about crypto projects, but the crypto land is here. And they're saying maybe a digital token, a digital token backed by US dollars or backed by euro or yen would be the way to address these pain points. Some are retail projects, mostly Tether and others on the retail side are about cryptocurrency exchanges, but the wholesale projects are interesting. 14 large banks have come together and formed this thing called Finality without an I, it, it's Fnality. JP Morgan is said JP Morgan coin. These are trying to use digital tokens representing fiat money to smooth out pain points. And then the messaging companies, Telegram, the world's largest secure or encrypted messaging company with 400 million uh, members or customers, they're trying to have a token called Gram, even though it's held up in the securities law case that they have with the Securities and Exchange Commission here in the US. And that sort of sets the stage. I'm gonna skip over that Bitcoin and all of these payment tokens are out there and talk about the goals they're trying to do. The goals they're trying to do are the same things, addressing pain points, extending settlement to 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and lowering costs. That's why JP Morgan has JP Morgan coin. It might be a little bit of hype, but there's some reality too that they think that, that between their project and this competitive project finality at the wholesale payment space, they can lower cost in the cross border space. So Facebook comes along and Facebook says, well, maybe we can do it. Maybe we can do it with a worldwide currency. They, they announced it was, it didn't lack ambition. <clears throat> Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook announced a new global currency to, to meet the needs of billions of people. They talked about financial inclusion. They talked about cross-border pain points. And they said, this, this is the, the wave of the future. It's run into a lot of central bank concerns around the globe. It's run into significant public sector concerns around the globe. It's still uncertain whether it will take off, but it's a significant feature of this payment space that one needs to understand, even if it's just a catalyst for change, both China and the US reacted quickly with the FedNow project here in the US and the central bank digital currency project in China. So I'm gonna close on just a little chart that shows Libra versus central bank digital currency and just say something about China's project. China's project, not yet live, digital currency electronic payment program. The issuer is the People's Bank of China. And this is a really important uh, question that is on a lot of people's mind. If a central bank issues a digital representation of money directly, what's the role of the commercial banks? Commercial banks in most countries are the issuer of digital money. I know we think about central banks in the 180 countries that have money, and they're really important, but it's commercial banks that keep those ledgers. The commercial banks with some backing of their governments, either implicit or explicit with deposit insurance, you and I have a liability to our banks, to Bank America, to Barclays, to some bank in Asia. The People's Bank of China is sort of saying, no, we will issue this directly, but we'll have the commercial banks involved. In the commercial banks, you'll get your digital wallet from the commercial banks. There were announcements as of early April, 2020, that sort of update us, but we don't yet have the full picture. Um, it looks like it's a, basically a centralized private network run by the PBOC. It does look like Alipay and WeChat Pay will have to use this system. So some question is how different will it really be? It looks like by government fiat, 
rolled out by city and region that merchants will have to accept DCEP. So the QR system on those buses will have to have DCEP, Alipay, and WeChat Pay. Alipay has taken out a bunch of patents already on how to interface with DCEP. So it's a work in progress, but it's an important feature of this. And, and if you're thinking about payments, this is really important. And what's fascinating is central banks around the globe are then looking to see what China's done. Sweden was already looking at an electronic digital central bank currency, the e-krona, and they were sort of at the forefront. But now you can go central bank around central bank. France has made announcements. The United Kingdom has made announcements in 2020. All sort of in this milieu of how do we address pain points? Do we as a central bank have a responsibility to our citizens to continue to offer a digital currency when the paper currency is going away? And important public policy questions of what does this do? Does it destabilize commercial banks? So I think that's... Um, a bit of a wrap.